Hey everyone, welcome to Food Talk Live. A reminder that this episode will also appear on our podcast, Food Talk with Danny Nirenberg. So please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. It really means a lot to me. Um, today we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm interviewing um, uh, or talking to, having a discussion with one of my favorite people in the world, and that's uh, Patrick Holden, who is the founding director and chief executive of the Sustainable Food Trust, which is based in England. Um, it's an organization that's really dedicated to harnessing the collective power of organizations, people, and communities to build more sustainable food systems that support human and environmental health. He's also a British farmer, an activist, an advocate who has really dedicated his whole life for organic and sustainable farming. Uh, Patrick and I have spent a lot of time together over the years uh, uh, at meetings, especially around the idea of true cost accounting in the food system. I really admire his dedication to making sure that eaters and businesses and all of us really understand the important role that livestock play in regenerative food and farming systems. So the, the different part of this is I'm not really going to be interviewing Patrick. We're sort of going to be just talking to one another. Um, and, and this is a little bit uh, you know, different than what we usually do. But I think it makes sense given that Patrick and I are old friends and we have a lot to discuss today. So Patrick, thanks so much for joining me as a co-host of, of this Food Talk and Sustainable Food Trust Live. Well, I think this is a wonderful connection. I'm so happy to be talking to you. I've always a greatly admired Food Tank. I kind of think we're sister organizations, really. Uh, we're completely dedicated to the same philosophy and principles and uh, program of action. And I know that you're an incredible communicator and uh, you are Sometimes. followed by so many people. <laughs> How many people follow you now? Oh, gosh. Uh, Bernie would know. On, on social media, more than a million. And our wow. newsletter reaches about 300,000. We, we, we talk to a lot of people, whether they like it or not. <laughs> well, we're all beer compared to you, but... Hopefully we're making a bit of a difference. Um, I'm, I'm actually to you from, from the farm. Uh, I just got back here from Devon because uh, due to COVID-19, we had to stop cheese making because we have this two meter sure. rule. You have that where you're not allowed to, you know, be more less than two meters between it with another person. Absolutely, right, right. Or whatever. It's six feet so, here, yeah. Yeah, we had a cheese vat that, you couldn't make cheese because you had to stir it. It needed two people. So I just went to get a Dutch right. cheese back from uh, Devon today and uh, brought it back on a trailer. And so we can reinstall it and we can start cheese making again. So we've had to stop for the last few weeks because we just couldn't do it. Oh my God. Safe. Yeah. Yeah, but, it's um, really affecting not only your farm, but so many farms all across uh, England. It really is. And interestingly enough, it's affected. The small farms, the artisan producers who are supplying, say, what we call food service, do you call it that, restaurants and everything, sure. uh, in a way, more than some of the very large industrial producers right. who are selling into uh, supermarkets. And the supermarkets have actually narrowed their range because in the UK, due to the closure of all the restaurants, uh, the supermarkets have had Christmas three times over. Their, their trade's actually gone up. Yeah. Uh, so they've Same kind here. of narrowed their range, and that means that people like us haven't. Well, we weren't in the supermarkets anyway. We used to be, but they 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 found us too difficult to deal with. So we were <laughs> um, we were exporting it. Actually, our cheese, a lot of our cheese goes to the U.S., which I'm very proud about. And you should be. That's amazing. Australia, which is interesting. It's a bit like the whiskey. Of, you know, it's a sort of it's a, a product which carries the message of the place, and uh, that, that's kind of paused. And then all the restaurant trade's gone, and some of the specialist cheese shops have closed. Um, so we had a period of about two weeks where we had hardly any orders at all. But now oh there's been amazing innovation, and everybody's developed online businesses. And I was speaking to Joel Salatin the other day, and he's got this right. drive-through operation, drive-through um, farmer's market, which I love the idea of. And things are really starting to pick up now. We're back to about two-thirds of the sales that we had before COVID started. So oh, that's great. Now. That's great. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Joe Solitan. He lives uh, in Virginia, sort of. Uh, I live in Maryland, so he's not far away. And I've met him many times, but so many farmers like him. And he, he produces livestock in a very holistic, regenerative way and is very sort of in tune with how 
animals should be treated and how the land should be treated. Um, so many farmers like Joel are, are putting together these drive through farmers markets. And, you know, we've heard from, you know, places like Minneapolis where they're doing them. Um, you know, one of the concerns, though, I heard from a farmer the other day is that that creates a model where you have farmers sitting in, in, in their trucks or their vans that are running. You're, you know, they're emitting uh, uh, emissions during that time. They're breathing that in. And, and people don't have the same sort of interaction that they would normally with a farmer because it's sort of just, you know, it, you've, you've already ordered online, it's sort of packaged and it's put into your trunk and you, you don't get that interaction. So I, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I, I agree that it's, you know, probably a good sort of short term way to keep farmers and consumers, you know, sort of, you know, dealing with one another. But what are your thoughts over the long term if, if the longer COVID, you know, keeps going? Well, you make uh, some very good points, and I guess we're all struggling to recreate a food map which really serves the planet and the public in a really good way, and all the online businesses and the incredible innovation, we're all at it. It's interesting. In so many ways, I feel that we're all connected at the moment. We're all right. having existential crises. We're wondering what's going to happen next. Where there's a lot of fear around, but there's also this innovation and inspiration. And I think we have to co-create the food systems which will replace the industrial model that we've been on the receiving end on, in some ways been part of for most of my farming lifetime. And we it's like a map without any, you know, features. So we have to yeah. try something, maybe the drive-through market is a temporary thing, I don't know. And then I heard yeah. a wonderful guy in West Wales called Gerard Miles the other day describing how he, he was born on his farm, sixth generation, and he's developed a CSA, which has now really expanded during COVID, and they're now supplying 100 families. And he said it's completely transformed his life on the farm. So maybe the CSA wow. model day has come, but one thing is sure, yeah. food has to be distributed more locally and regionally and maybe uh, this is going to be a permanent feature of new food systems transparency direct connections between the farmer and the person who eats the food these things are, are right but how we get the carbon right and the distribution right we have to co-create that together it's exciting absolutely absolutely i love that you're using that term co-create i want to get back you you mentioned um how food companies are really making bank right now. I mean, you know, grocery store shelves are, are you know, empty as soon as they're filled and, and big food is, is making a lot of money while, or at least they did at the very beginning of this crisis. And, you know, I, I think, you know, that will likely continue. You know, people are, are still continuing to hoard food and, and, and buy more than they need for the, you know, the few days or the few weeks. Um, you know, the, people are shopping very differently than they did before. And a few weeks ago, we talked to um, Chef Dan Barber, who had, you know, similar concerns to you that this is really sort of, you know, at least at the very beginning of the crisis, you know, regional and local food systems couldn't keep up because you're all adapting. You're, you know, you're suddenly going online and suddenly having these drive through markets. And so I wonder if there's a way that the longer, you know, one of the silver linings of COVID maybe is that the longer it goes on, the more chance that those regional food systems have to be, you know, really competitive uh, in a in a more fair way, and you know, creating a better landscape with the big food companies because they'll have figured it out better and they're able to pivot more. I think that's right. I think that we're just at the beginning of a, a chapter of change, and we don't know what the end result will be. But I think everyone's affected. I ha I did an interview with a magazine. Uh, called The Grocer today, which is the UK's kind of go-to magazine for big food companies and big retailers. And yeah. um, the woman was doing a whole feature on the circular economy. And she said to me, how do you think these big food companies should respond to this? And I said, well, on the one hand, they may be feeling a little bit complacent because their sales have risen, but they must be aware in the back of their minds that their own customers are thinking in a different way about food. Like, I don't know if you're having this in the US, but the seed companies for vegetables. You just can't buy vegetable seeds. And this is like right. animals know when the tsunami is coming. You know, there's a right. thing that we're food insecure and we need to do something to change that. So I right. said, you know, a lot of these big brands, whether it's a sort of um, Coca-Cola or something like that, they think they're impregnable and they're in the sort of brand cruise where they think nothing could touch them. But look at Kodak. 
you know, and we need yeah. to, I, the, I was saying to the grocer, right. they, they need to be mindful that their own customers are starting to think differently. And it may be tiny and it may That's be a great early point. Early disruptors, but these disruptors, these disruptive and very positive innovations in food systems, new food systems, uh, could suddenly uh, grow, spread. Maybe scale is a bit of a sort of mechanical word, but they could spread in yeah. a very interesting way and suddenly be a serious new opportunity to replace what we've got at the moment. And I think the very interesting yeah. question, how, should, how big food companies should react to this? I mean, are they so large that they're like the vast super tanker that cannot reverse their direction now because they're so right. separate? Or do they need to think in a different way? It's a very interesting question. Well, and I think so many of them were at least, you know, publicly trying to say that they were thinking in a different way, you know, BC before COVID and, you know, with more sort of sustainable initiatives or, you know, um, putting together innovation hubs and supporting smaller companies and, and that kind of thing. But I don't think, you know, at sort of the, the company wide level, you have the, you have these pockets of people at some of these big food companies who are, are very committed to sustainability and sort of live and breathe it, but they haven't been able to reach the whole company. So maybe it's an opportunity. So maybe, you know, all the, the, the sort of consumer awareness that you're talking about where people are like, oh, we have to buy seeds, we have to grow our own food, we have to, you know, support local farmers. Maybe that will, you know, trickle to, to these big food companies and they'll figure out a way to change how they've been practicing. I, because you're such an expert on, on livestock, you know, I'm sure you've been watching what's been happening here, and I'm sure similar stuff is happening in 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 the uh, in England and, and uh, really around. Me what's been happening? Me yeah, I mean, That's I was terrible. reading this morning about how we're going to have to gas thousands of pigs, and, and they'll never be used for human consumption because we don't have the processing uh, facilities available to handle them because so many of those folks who work at processing plants have COVID. So uh, can you talk a little bit about the way you raise animals and, and why that, you know, such a different, I mean, it's not a, it's the model we used to have and we forgot it and we lost yeah. it. And, and your farmers like you are bringing it back. Well, we're trying to, but I mean, I have to say, you know, Joel Salatin, Will Harris, uh, you know, there are, you've got some great farmers in the U.S. who are practicing at scale regenerative methods uh, sure. and doing it really well. But what we are doing here is we're trying to um, farm according to the principles of the circular economy, this idea that everything is finite, that everything is circular, there is no such thing as waste in a true uh, right. food economy. And right. we are trying to look after the natural capital that we find on this hill, the soil, the biodiversity, all the resources we have, including the human resources. And our aim is to produce as much food as possible without diminishing our capital, ideally building it. We've been here 47 years. Uh, I came as a hippie in the 70s. And I love the it. place tonight looks indescribably beautiful. And we're making, we're actually, we're making silage um, for our winter feed today. Outside there, there's tractors going. And the soil is full of life. And we've got a lot of diversity on the farm. So we have a crop rotation, which includes the, the oats and peas, which the cows eat. We mill them to feed them cow muesli. Um, and we have Ayrshire cows who are a native breed. Um, and we produce uh, milk from those cows. We're only milking once a day. That's one of the changes we've made during COVID. Mm. It's the first time we've ever done that. And most of the milk normally goes to make a single farm raw milk cheese. Um, uh -huh. or Havod, and the young animals, including the male calves, we don't see them as a you know something to get rid of. We rear them on whey, uh, and we foster them onto their either their mothers or foster calves for at least twelve, yeah. weeks, sometimes sixteen weeks, and then this um, ruby veal uh, becomes one of the products that we can produce. And we try to keep our cows for as long as possible, and we're trying to be self-sufficient in animal feed. Um, and in everything, the bedding, and even we'd like to move towards uh, saving our own seed because we think everything in the end should be so yeah. We also believe that we ought to uh, produce energy from our farm as, 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 as much as possible. And I think we represent, like, the farm is the cell of the food system. Mm -hmm. If you can have a healthy farm, then you scale that, and the food system can be healthy. And I think yeah. many of the 
we are doing here are replicable anywhere in the world. It's not we we have a lot of rain normally, although we've had no, none for two months now, virtually none. Wow. Um, but the whether you're in a wet place or a dry place, whether you're in a hot place or a cool place, the principles of sustainable agriculture are common, and livestock, I believe, play an important role in soil fertility building as long yeah. as they're looked after properly and fed in the case of ruminant animals cattle and sheep mainly grass or exclusively grass so the grass fed yeah. thing is important and we have i believe although we haven't been uh, keeping adequate data which is a shame because we've been here for so long but certainly my own uh, the evidence of my own eyes tells me uh, that we are building soil and we are producing crops and livestock which are increasingly healthy and i think the first and foremost responsibility of any nation is to feed itself from its own resources and ideally the food that we eat should be grown local locally to us or regionally anyway if we're in a big city we can't grow it all sure. in the yard and that's i believe the principle that will drive the changes we need to see in food and farming yeah I, i'm sure you get asked this question a lot because i know i do and what you're describing makes so much sense it seems logical but there are folks who call it you know romanticizing agriculture and there's no way that we can feed everyone with that type of agriculture especially you know when we're looking at 10 billion by 25th year or whatever what what do you say to them patrick i often get i you know i usually have a some sort of feel but sometimes i get stumped because i i don't want to romanticize the kind yeah. of farming that you're doing because it's very labor intensive it's hard work it's very knowledge intensive it, you know, it has all of these components to it. And I, I don't want to, you know, I, I think there are lots of ways that agriculture can happen, you know, in big and small ways that we can do farming. Um, but what we've lost is is the sustainability that you're talking about. So, I, you know, anyway, I, I wonder how you answer that question that we're, we're all naive when we romanticize farms like yours or, or farms like Joe Salton. Well, maybe sometimes it's romantic here. Not always. Sometimes it's just <laughs> but I think it's real. You know, I think what we are grappling with here is the real challenge of producing food without degrading nature. And yeah. I can't see how that question shouldn't be the question which confronts every farmer and every citizen on planet Earth right now. Because yeah. if we carry on as we've been going, we will have an unlivable planet. There's no question about that. And agriculture is responsible for a considerable percentage of the emissions yeah. causing climate change. And also it's massively responsible for the uh, reduction in biodiversity. So to people who say you'll never feed the world, I say, I say this. First of all, we're wasting half the food we produce. And waste right. is, I think, a symptom of an unsustainable agriculture and food system. And secondly, our food is much less nutrient dense than it used to be. And thirdly, that we will need to align our future diets to the productive capacity of the farmland near to where we live. And in the case of Wales, it's that we are a nation of grass. It's probably 80% pasture. So the only way you can turn pasture land into food that we can eat is to graze it with ruminant animals. And of course, yeah. we don't, don't only do that here. We try to grow crops. We, we've been quite significant vegetable growers in the past until the supermarkets decided to source all their vegetables from the other side of the country and close right. the houses around here. And that's happened with everybody. You know, this industrial agriculture has resulted in a lot of centralization of facilities. So we haven't any longer got around here, whether it's the pack houses or the processing factories for cheese or whatever, they've all gone because of this centralization. But I think if we want to build a resilient food system and then eat in line with what the land can produce around us, which must include the right kind of livestock products, not the industrial yeah. ones, we right. give up eating industrial pork and chicken altogether. I mean, it's clearly wrong. There's no question about that. So we need to learn to differentiate between the livestock, which are part of the problem, which is all the feedlot beef and the horrible hog units and all the things we know about, and the livestock, which are not only part of the solution, but which we need to eat, because otherwise we can't yeah. uh, enable the farmers to rebuild their soil. So yeah. I think it's a, and I know that, you know, you're doing a lot of educational work in this, um, and I think it's really exciting that more and more people are interested in how farming systems can work. And if we did all that, by the way, 
apparently we if we didn't waste so much food we're already producing enough food to feed 14 million people it's just distributed wrongly and it's the wrong kind of processing and it's degraded and it's making people sick so i have absolutely yeah. no doubt whatsoever that we can and we don't need to polarize the debate necessarily by using the word organic i mean i was one of the developers of the organic standards many years ago but i think we now need to have a more inclusive approach so we don't say these guys are bad and these guys are good we need to make sure. it economically viable for farmers to produce sustainable food and at the moment because of the absence of true cost accounting as you and i have discussed many times it's very difficult too many times <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you know i was on um, howard buffett's farm a few years ago now, right and decatur yeah. illinois and uh, i was on his combine and i said to him when did you last have livestock on this farm uh -huh. You know, it wasn't that long ago. And he said, watch this. And we were combining genetically modified corn. Sure. It was on a big John Deere combine with lots of computers and stuff. And he said, check this out. And we were just at the bottom of a hill. And there was a very lush, fertile, you know, sort of high yielding bit of corn at the bottom of the hill. And he said, that's where the livestock used to lie. And he said, it's maybe 15 years ago since the livestock were here. Wow. But you're seeing a big yield benefit so i think for the midwest for the corn belt the changes that are needed in the corn belt are going to be fundamental we need to keep the cattle and finish them on the farms instead of trucking them off to feedlots right cattle need to be reared on the farms and then they need to be uh, slaughtered locally uh and because they're part of the fertility building cycle so it's a complete restructuring of our food systems yeah. we, that's how big it is we Absolutely, we need that infrastructure back. I mean, communities used to have that. In your in your country, where we live, there used to be local processing and all that kind of thing. There was a question that was up. I'm wondering, Bernie, if you can put it back up. Um, it, what are your thoughts on our food consumption habits or lifestyle in post in a post COVID nineteen world? Any advice to farmers in the developing world or policymakers? So, with the lifestyle, it is it's as a citizen. Uh, what I think what you should do if you're a citizen, say you're li living in a city, you're obviously disconnected from farmers, but it's possible to take action, even if you don't manage it with all your food, to try to make a, 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 a pledge to yourself to source a certain percentage of your food, maybe your fresh vegetables and your salads, or maybe your fresh meat from yeah. farms that are not too far from where you are. I mean, if you're in New York, it's still, you know, there are peri-urban farms in, in upstate New York that need Hudson support. Valley, yeah. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. and some wonderful farms. And Amazing so, farms. So make a commitment to buy food from those farmers. Farmers you know, farmers whose story you know, ideally as sustainable as possible. Even if you make a commitment to, be, to buy only a small percentage of the food that you eat from those farms, you are a powerful person because you're an agent of change. Because if enough right. of us do this, then our food systems will change. So I, yeah, I think it's all about empowerment. As far as farmers are concerned, I mean, the interesting thing about the so-called developing world is that really it's us that, are the undeveloped world because we've proved our agriculture so badly and our food systems so badly that we're sick <laughs> and our soils are sick and dying. So actually, we can learn from so-called developing countries. Uh, yeah. And my message to farmers in developing countries is keep on doing what you already know about. Protect the indigenous knowledge that you hopefully have inherited. Don't be yeah. spooked by people who will tempt you into buying fertilizers and pesticides and growing commodity crops because the end point and i know this is you become a commodity slave because you end up selling products which are not very good at or below the co cost of production you have no power you're a price taker not a price maker yeah. and these products go into this industrial food chain and everyone suffers and even right. the supermarkets and the big food companies are suffering now they're they're slaves to a system which we're all part of which is just going to the it's a race to the bottom and it is a race to the bottom us up. yeah no and I, I love your point about how we should be learning from farmers in the global south because they what they've been doing to protect indigenous crops and in, indigenous livestock breeds so many things that we should have been doing you know for the last 20 30 40 years 50 yeah. years that we just don't know how to do anymore and i i also want to touch on that that point, and I, I'm interested in what you what you'll say about this, um, Patrick. Is you know, 
I, I think we absolutely have to rethink how we eat meat in this world. You, you know, pre-COVID, after COVID, and, and looking at meat, as you said, being very careful about our choices, choosing from farmers like yourself who are doing it the right way, where the land is taken care of, the animals are taken care of, farmers are taken care of, and looking at meat sort of not at the center of your plate, but more, you know, as a, as a, a side dish, as a, as a condiment, as something that, you know, gives flavor, it's something that, you know, has a, a specialness to it, that you, you celebrate it, you celebrate the, the animal, you celebrate the farmer who, 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 you know, raised it, that it's more of a, a special thing than it has been, because I think oh. people so mindlessly consume meat from, you know, these industrial operations, because it's cheap and, you know, it's not cheap in terms of its effects on the environment or public health, but cheap in terms of how much it costs right now. And I think that will, that will change over time when people, if people were really paying the price of it for industrial meat, what it actually costs for, you know, medical costs and, and, and the, the pollution costs, it would be much, much more expensive than it is. Absolutely. And, you know, you can see that we did a, an animation of, uh, when we had that conference in San Francisco in 2016, I think it was, and it was, yeah. it was called The Tale of Two Chickens. We went to two supermarket, a supermarket in Northern California and bought an industrial chicken and a pasture reared organic chicken. And there was, a, I think, a fourfold difference in the price. The true price was the pastured organic chicken. And we should get used to paying much more for good yeah. meat and just don't buy the bad meat because it's bad for us and it's bad for the planet. But I think one issue that comes out of this discussion is you know, the relationship between farmers in so-called developing countries and farmers in the, in the developed world and international trade. And as you know, we, yeah. stupid, in my opinion, voted for Brexit. That was like for Turkey's voting for Christmas. Um, but we, we are where we are. And uh, now, despite COVID, there is an agriculture bill which was just voted through our parliament yesterday and a big protest from a coalition of farmers organizations, environmental groups and food organizations, all of whom said to our government, who are very keen on global trade, we don't want global trade at any price. And there was a very famous, I don't know if it's, this is, you've become aware of this, but there was a very famous example of the inappropriate trade about chlorinated chickens. And oh, uh, yeah. Michael Gove, who was our ag sec at the time, said, no way will we import chlorinated chickens. But now the agriculture bill has gone through Parliament, as it was voted through by the Conservative government yesterday. Uh, there was a big lobby for, from all these groups, including the farmers groups, including our National Farmers Union, to say, we don't want to have imports from uh, other countries produced to lower standards than our farmers are using because right. that undercuts us in the marketplace. And uh, unfortunately, the bill went through, although it mm. may be reprieved in the House of Lords. But what I think is really interesting that comes out of this is I met your Ag Secretary, Sonny Perdue, um, last sure. week. And uh, we found, I found that he liked good cheese. So if I meet him again, <laughs> I shall bring him some proper cheese. And stick <laughs> but the conversation I want to have with them is this. Who, it, you know, I know that it, it, the politics of your country are challenging at the moment. Let's just say that. Very. But the fact is, in the end, politicians have to do what the people want. And it may be for a short time that they, they can get away with doing the opposite. But in the long run, they need to do what they want. So yeah. here's my proposition to Sonny Perdue or his successor, or indeed, Yale Lempert, who is the woman who represents your interests in the American Embassy in London, who's uh, a civil servant. So she she came she came into her position during the Obama administration. Uh -huh. I met her. She said chlorinated chicken. I said no. Let's not talk about chlorinated chicken. Let's talk about sustainable trade between our two nations. Let's talk about setting a, a high standard, and then trading only with those sustainably produced foods. And if yeah. an American poultry producer or a UK intensive dairy farmer, whoever, wants to send food to your country or mine, which is produced to lower standards, then we should have taxes or tariffs which make sure that your producers or our producers are not disadvantaged by that wrong right. kind of food. And she said, I like that. So I'm not sure she's told President Trump yet. But <laughs> I, I don't see why we couldn't do that. No, it makes it's common sense, yeah. 
absolutely, absolutely. There, there are thousands of folks in the US who would like that. And millions thousands, of Yeah, thousands and thousands and thousands of eaters. Millions of eaters would like something like that too. Uh, Bernie, can you put the comment that was up before? There was another question. Sorry, I missed it. No? Okay. We'll, get, we'll just keep talking, Patrick. You know, put it up again. How, here oh, here go. it is. Okay. <laughs> so, has Britain joined the rest of, of European countries in curbing use of glyphosate and other chemicals? Huh. Not yet. But there's, a, <laughs> right. there's a dairy farm just down the road from me that just sprayed all their grassland with glyphosate. It's environmental value. Why? And yeah. it's really banned. And we in the Sustainable Food Trust have been championing uh, the, the cause of research to look at the impact of glyphosate on human health. And we're going to set up a, a, a fund uh, to fund research, more research in this field. Um, and one of the donors uh, lives in San Francisco, and he's looking to establish a coalition of people who are prepared to put the money up to fund more research in this field. Because yeah. We need evidence of harm. And the best way to do that is a, a large scale trial, which is free of any accusation that it's not impartial and scientific. We can yeah. do that. And we need to because glyphosate is a poison and it's poisoning the people. And it's going to affect millions of people all over the world. It already is. But we mm -hmm. have absolute cast iron proof of the causal relationship between glyphosate use and poor uh, impacts on negative impacts on human health. We must put that together. This needs to be an international program. So, Absolutely. Anyway, well, well, you know, let's do this. Yeah. Together. Absolutely. And I mean, this idea of, of funding research around, you know, making sure that we know the actual dangers, that there's documented proof of glyphosate, you know, that, that's an incredible research project. Um, there, but there are so many research, so, so much research has been done on, on, you know, building more sustainable food systems. But with COVID hitting, one of the things that I've been thinking about and talking about with, you know, scientists and researchers and agronomists is, where does that research, what happens during a pandemic to all of that research? And it really, it's something that scares me because I don't want us, I know we have to solve this really serious health crisis, but I don't want us to forget all of the other ag research that needs to be done. Yeah, that's a very important point. And even the COVID crisis itself, and there's all this science going on to see if we can get a test that's reliable to find out if you've had it. There was this on our national news today. But in a way, the COVID issue raises an important question about what is health? What is positive right. health, you know? And I'm not saying that, you know, if we all ate good food, we ne we wouldn't get COVID. That's clearly not true because we've got a naive immune systems and this is a newly evolved virus and we're vulnerable. But the fact is, the fact that it's killing the old and not the young suggests that the more vital your constitution is, the less likely sure. you have really serious um, impact of the disease. So I hope it's asking all of us to ask more questions about the quality of the food we eat. Um, what's it saying? How can I bring back local sustainable food chain? How right. can we? Well, That's I think, yeah. The, yeah. Well, I think we just have to do I mean, it. seasonal food, it's such a good question. Yeah. Yep. Uh, we have to, in the end, we're the powerful ones. I mean, people, farmers who want to supply people and are developing these new um, innovative systems, they need customers. So I think we need to just exercise our buying power. There, there's lots of challenges in how we design the food systems yeah. food from the farms in an environmentally friendly way. Your point, uh, earlier point about uh, the drive-through farmer's market, maybe this is just a temporary thing. But we, it's a big challenge, isn't it, to work out how we can do local and seasonally grown food to people who want it in the right way. Right, well, that seasonal question is one that I think about a lot because when you can get asparagus from Peru any time of, you know, in, in the winter in the United States, you know, people don't understand. I, I think it, they don't understand how good things taste when you eat them at the time of year that they're meant to be eaten. Um, that, you know, and I think, you know, it, it requires really changing our palates and getting people to eat more of those foods and to not be so, you know, I, and we all do it, you know, we all want good food, but not to be so sort of 
selfish about, you know, what you get, you, be, not being able to get everything you want whenever you want it. I think, you know, in the United States, when there are 24 hour grocery stores or, you know, takeaway that you can get 24 hours a day, we've become very sort of selfish about how we eat. So I want to get back to these, these comments that have come up. Yeah, I thought, from that, our I viewers. thought about labor intensive. That's really interesting. Yeah. Do you know, I think, uh, physical labor has demeaned, been demeaned, and we have, you and we yeah. both have an economic underclass of people who work in the fields and who prepare and pack most of the food we eat. That has to change. We have to restore the status, the cultural status, the social status, the economic status of people who work physically on the land to a higher level. And we yeah. on this farm need people to come and work with us we need cheesemakers. We need yeah. people who can come and milk cows with us. We have an Australian woman with us at the moment who's helping out on the farm, and she wants right. to make a career of it. And I really think this issue of changing the way in which we see physical labor, producing food, and the skills that go with that is really critical. Because actually the human body was designed to do physical work. Right, yeah. we were designed to work, yeah. you yeah. know. <laughs> working physically on the farm with animals or on the land weeding crops this is a beautiful thing and right we, and we I, yeah I, I don't want to under you know i want to i don't want to undermine that there is drudgery involved in some aspects of farming you know uh but at the same time what we're forgetting that along with that physical labor and i think this is what you're alluding to patrick is that you have to have a lot of knowledge so whether we're talking about farm workers you know uh in, in california or you know the the labor that's working on your farm. Those are folks who know they know how to pick, they know when to pick, they know you know how to do all of these things that most of us don't. So even though it is physical and it's you know often very laborious, it also requires knowledge. So looking down on folks or pay you know not paying them a living wage, I mean that's one of the greatest travesties of of our current food system really? that we look down on the people who feed us. Absolutely. And I do believe this is going to change things. And in a way, you say it's laborious. I guess, I mean, I still milk. Um, not every day, of course, because I've got my day job. But I look forward to milking. And do I sometimes think at the beginning of milking, which takes about an hour and a half, wow, we've still got all those cows out in the collecting yard. <laughs> When's it going to be breakfast? I do think that. But equally, there's a sort of rhythm to it. And there's a progression. There's a mood progression. Right. And actually, sometimes to continue to work physically when you've got the resistance of your body saying, oh, I'm tired and, you know, I don't really want to do this. I'd rather go go back to bed or something. Even right. that process of overcoming that resistance is a very spiritual thing, I think. Yeah. Because when you yeah. work hard with your body, you feel more connected. You feel more attentive. You feel better physically. Sure. There's more uh, ability to take in the world in which you find yourself in a, in a really meaningful way. So I think we've got to start to shift all our attitudes towards um, our relationship with the land and our physical relationship. Right. right. And it's like, you know, I know you run, you're a runner. And it's like that when you start running or when you start any form of exercise, you're like, oh, God, when is this going to be over? And then you kind of hit that peak where you're, yeah. you have, you know, and you, it is, you know, becomes rhythmic and you have, you know, there is a spiritual element to, to that kind of working out as well. And it's not just working art. You yeah. know, you have good thoughts. Sometimes when I'm milking, I have amazing thoughts. Right. And right. they're sort of more grounded thoughts, if you know what I mean. You know, they're more, right. they're more solid thoughts because it's, because right. you can get no, I mean, red and then, you know, the thoughts are rather, they don't have weight, if you know what I mean. Sure. For so sure. I, no, I, it's one of the, uh, yeah. Sorry, keep we, we, we need to find ways for more people to get involved with working on the land and make that part of, you know, with maybe some kind of national service or, I mean, you know, sure. it should be part of what, what we learn to do. Uh, and then we got a skill. Agreed. And it's, no, I've always, <laughs> I've always said I, people to want to go for a career in food and farming. This is an interesting question. It is, and I've always said I don't trust people who haven't either worked on a farm for you know a short or a long yeah. amount of time, or worked in a restaurant because I've done both, and, and they're both very hard jobs, and and yeah. I think and but very rewarding too, and so I think yeah. 
you know, we have to rethink how we how we view these jobs in, in the food system and, and, you know, give, give more weight to them, give more respect, more honor. It's certainly something that, you know, we're thinking a lot about in the United States with all the restaurant closures and, you know, millions and millions of people who worked in the food industry, at least 14 million, uh, you know, who are out of work, who've lost jobs as, you know, wait staff, as line cooks, you know, uh, the whole, the whole range of, of folks working in the food system. So, you know, giving them the respect that they need, giving them the living wages they need to work because, you know, we, we've we put them down for so long and they've, they've, they've just been abused. So it, it's really time to, to give that respect. It sure, certainly is. So um, how do you see, you know, what, what, let me ask you some questions. Do you think that the COVID shock, which has been massive and is continuing, is going to herald some kind of a permanent change of attitude in the American people towards their food systems? Or do you think it's just all going to be back to normal when things do finally start to reopen? Uh, my feeling is it, it, it there's something lasting about this. Yeah, I, I, I go, you know, I have two minds about it because it's like what we were talking about before, like, you know, it's panic versus hope. And, you know, every minute of the day, my mind changes about how I feel you know, how people are getting through this or how inspired I am or how hopeless I feel. So it, 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 my mind changes about this constantly. But I do think that we've hit what, you know, maybe it, maybe this is the tipping point. And I, I hope it is where we realize that our our food system is so connected to health and everything else. I mean, what we're seeing in the United States is that people with diet related diseases, often people of color who, who live in underserved areas and who are, you know, uh, ha have not been uh, served well by their governments or by their communities, that they're often most at risk. So people who already are suffering from a poor food system are most affected by this. So I hope that's at least getting through to people that, you know, if you have, uh, diabetes or other diet related diseases that, you know, you're more at risk and that's not your fault. That's the fault of a, of a poor economic and, and government system that is, that is failing you and the, the fault of a poor food system. So I do not think that we can go back to the way things were. I don't think that is even possible now at this point because you have people who are really awakening to the fact that that food is important and that you know some of the, the themes that we've been talking about that it shouldn't be so cheap and the people who serve it and make it and slaughter it shouldn't be paid so poorly i think they're they're you know th those things can't be unseen at this point i think that's right and one of the big questions for us certainly is whether the government please the issues which have been occupying the parliamentarians as i mentioned uh, just in the last 24 hours as being a significant political shift because certainly in the UK, uh, food and agriculture hasn't featured on the big political landscape, yeah. not on our news every day. And I mean, right. I mean, shocking happens, it is like your livestock slaughtering. But, you know, generally speaking, that politicians don't think food is an electoral issue. So... If we're going to get the polluter to pay, which is an incentive, which is really the solution to the absence of true cost accounting, and if we're going to reward, change the farm bill to provide incentives to farmers who farm in a sustainable way, only then yeah. will the economics change so that it becomes more profitable to farm in a sustainable way than in an unsustainable way. But right. in order to do that, we need to have some government action, and I think we're we're still away from there, but. Yeah. We really do need that to happen because, you know, the truth is that the farm bill indirectly, indirectly is subsidizing the present system. And the you add that to the absence of the polluter pay principle being applied in which if Roundup was, you know, linked to a tax on the impact, negative impact. It has no, no farmers would use it anymore. It'd be too expensive, yeah. for instance. So we need to really make sure that politicians become aware that food is connected to health. And so much of our national life depends on secure and sustainable food systems, including but, the future of our planet. But Patrick, why don't they know this? I mean, people like you have been, you know, beating this drum for more than 40 years. I've been doing it for 20 now. I don't understand. And there are so many great organizations, much bigger than mine or yours, who have been saying this for years and years. So 
like does does it take a global pandemic to for you know no. to get their attention i think it does i think it takes a shock and maybe some fear but uh, but then also the hope and the inspiration that there can be a better way so i think people like you uh, who've done incredible job it mustn't it's like the surfer waiting for the wave you might think it you know, it's never going to come and then it comes you know i feel that this nearly is a we're moving towards a tipping point and i think it will be shocks and maybe the, yeah. the COVID thing hasn't been shocking enough yet i hate to say that maybe it needs to be even more shocking to the point where there's an existential threat you know maslow's hierarchy of needs you know First of all, you have to feed yourself. Yeah. Like, if you're really not able to feed yourself, then you will migrate or whatever. But perhaps even in developed countries, the shock hasn't been quite extreme enough, but we're getting there. And I think a lot of people now are sublimely yeah. aware that we're actually facing potentially more food security emergencies in the future and something needs to be done. And eventually that needs to find expression in the politicians we elect. Absolutely, absolutely. I've talked a lot about this on this live cast and with people like Sam Cass, who worked uh, in the Obama administration, um, about, yeah, you know Sam well, about this, you know, idea of whether there is a food movement. And he said, like you you said, you know, unless they have, you know, unless the food movement has electoral power, then there's not really a movement. And so this, you know, might be what pushes the food and agriculture movements to really have that that power and that you know but i at the same time we need to get money out of out of politics in the united states we need campaign finance reform we need all of these other things to sort yeah. of be happening simultaneously yeah yeah and we we i also would think it's very important that we mustn't make this as i you know i've been i'm telling this against myself i think it's very easy to demonize big food or big ag sure uh, you know, say actually we're right and everyone's wrong. I think we have to have a for this change to work. It has to be inclusive. So mm -hmm. we have to find a way. It's not really the fault of the big scale farmers who have been using all the Roundup Ready crops and everything. No. They're just following the money, and only only farmers with a day job like me have the luxury of being able to farm in a more sustainable way because sure. we have a, another income. So we need to create the conditions where these farmers who in their hearts know that what they've been doing hasn't really been right for them or yeah. the people that eat their food, to be able to change and still stay in business. That needs to be our aim now. And we can explain to, I, I often think that if you say to a farmer, look, of course you've been farming intensively, you need to make money. And that's been yeah. the most profitable business case. So what we need to do collectively now is to change the economic environment in which farms operate so that doing the right thing pays and doing the wrong thing doesn't. At the moment, and for so long now, it's to be the opposite of that. I think we can no, do it. I think we can do it too. And, you know, I, we talked to Jeff Moyer from uh, the Rodale Institute yesterday, and I know you know that that organization well. And well, he said actually, exactly the I, same I, thing. Rodale is, op is the, uh, um, the chair of the Sustainable Food Trust. Of course. So, yeah. of course. <laughs> no, and I mean, you said exactly the same thing. You're all connected. It's a small world, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to make sure before we end, Patrick, that people know where to find out more information about you so they can go to sustainablefoodtrust.org. Do you want to give out any other websites? Well, we have um, a, a also a fortnightly newsletter, which people can sign up to. Uh, and it's uh, obviously quite a few of the stories that we put out are UK centric, but not all of them because we're we feel totally involved with the US situation, and we feel completely linked with you. We feel we've got common cause, so we we we'd love you to uh, to follow us uh, on Twitter or or look at, visit our website. Also, if you want to know about um, this farm, um, Havod Cheese. Uh, H A F O D cheese, and we 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 post films, and uh, the in a way our Instagram account is just the story of the life on this farm, and I think that's a great way to very cool like the power of Instagram to show what people at farmers are doing is really strong. I love that. It so, is, and uh, we'll we'll have all those um, handles available on our website um and 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 our at foodtank.com so people will know how to find you i'll make sure and i'll make sure they sign up for your newsletter patrick and that they they look at instagram because you do have a really beautiful account um 
any any final thoughts, my friend? Any any parting wisdom you want to give me and our viewers and listeners? Well, only that I just feel that this is a time of feeling that we're all connected. And I tell you, yes, one one thing that we've been working on the last couple of years is is uh, a project which we call the Harmony Project, which is really about the interconnected right. thing and how we need to make sense of the world in which we find ourselves and, and help our children to do the same. And we, we can do that by uh, showing the next generation in schools um, that the, the curriculum that exists at the moment is really dull. It just teaches yeah. children to repeat stuff in exams. And it's just a rat race, really. But yeah. actually, that same curriculum could be changed to enable children to ask questions about where they find themselves and their relationship with nature. And I think that's yeah. an expression in farming. And I've been personally very inspired by this harmony principle, set of principles, to the extent that I now realize that I want to look at my own farming system through a different lens, the lens of interconnectedness. And I'm writing yeah. a chap called Richard Dunn, who's a head teacher who's been working, who's now working with us, who had a very successful uh, school in uh, near London where he applied these harmony principles, has written a book about it, which is an amazing um, manual on how uh, elementary schools can actually uh, change the education system. I'm now writing a book about the harmony principles in food and farming with Richard Dunn. Um, I love it. Showing how a farmer can look at the nature with which we re interact every day and make sense of it in a new way. And I think that's a really important thing because this is a, these issues we've been discussing, they can be political, they can be physical, they can be economic, but they're also, they're bigger than that. They're, they're, they're to do with the relationship of, 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 we have with the planet on which we find ourselves. That's what interests me now. Absolutely. What a wonderful point to end on. I'm so glad I had the chance to talk to you and to see you. I know you have a barbecue to host tonight with your family. So well, I my, want you to get my, back to my 19th birthday today, so we're going to go. Oh, nice. Great. We're going to go barbecue sausages from the pigs that were way, way reared on this farm. I love it. I love it. Um, thank you so much again, sustainablefoodtrust.org. Um, a reminder that this episode will also appear on our podcast, Food Talk with Danny Nirenberg. And please join me uh, for our next episode when I'll be talking to Sanjeev Krishnan from F2D uh, Ventures. Thank you so much, Patrick. You please stay well. Danny, bless you and all your followers. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Bye. Bye.